All right, so welcome to Biblical Archaeology. This is going to be your final review, right? Okay, so feel free to print this out if you want to um, and follow along. Uh, you can fill in the answers. We're going to kind of go through this one and uh, and talk about it. So I'm going to go quick um, through it. Uh, if you have to, you know, pause, rewind, do whatever you got to do, okay? All right, let's get started. Um, this... And just so you know, if you, if you haven't taken a final with me, these will be the questions on the final. Uh, they may not be in this order, though, right? Okay. Number one, list and define the two words that make up the word archaeology, right? So um, what we're after here is archaeos and logos, archaeos and logos. So archaeos uh, means ancient, I think archaic, right? Archios means ancient, and logos means word. Right? So that's what we're after. Archaeos, ancient, logos, word. Describe what archaeology first meant. Okay, so what I'm after here is when when you think about the word archaeology, so ancient and word, right? It was really just the study of uh, ancient writings, really. Um, was what it, you know, particularly biblical writings. So when archaeology first was being used, it was a reference to ancient writings, and it kind of evolved over time to be anything ancient that was applicable to the biblical world, which then started including uh, archaeological discoveries, uh, ancient artifacts, things of that nature, and then it has evolved to be not just ancient discoveries about the world of the Bible, but now archaeology just means ancient discoveries of, of anything from anywhere, right? So, so but what archaeology first meant um, was really ancient writings, right? Archaeos, ancient word, right? Ancient writings. Okay, uh, number three, why is the goal of archaeology not about proving the Bible? Well, um, we're not out to create faith in people, particularly, right? I mean, um, the archaeology probably is not going to be the defining moment of faith in people's lives. That comes by the Spirit and by believing in Jesus Christ. Um, archaeology's goal is not to prove the Bible, right? We, we believe in the Bible already. And so we, we come to the Bible already believing it, right? As believers, that is that is the Word of God. The goal of archaeology for us then is to help fill in the details and to um, fill in the world of the Bible by excavating and discovering what things were like there. Because the Bible only gives us uh, clues and, and little statements here and there, and often it doesn't really describe the world um, it, it tells the story that happened, right? Archaeology gives us a better understanding of the world that the Bible emerged from, right? Number four, what is an ostracon? That was one of the, the pieces of clay or pottery of some kind that was broken to use as a, um, like a scratch pad to write on, right? Number five, what is stratigraphy? Stratigraphy is the idea of one civilization being built on top of another, right? So that they are, um, that's what forms these large tell mounds that we talked about in class, that, that one civilization builds on the ruins of another. And stratigraphy are these different layers of civilizations, right? Number six, list and give an approximate date range for the six major time frames of antiquity. All right, so. You'll probably need to go back in and, and look at this on one of the videos, but I'll just give you a clue as to what we're talking about here. I'm thinking Early Bronze Age, Middle Bronze Age, Late Bronze Age, Iron Age 1 and 2, and Neolithic, right? Uh, so those are the, the six that I'm wanting. Uh, you may go back in and, and look at your notes or the previous video for that one to to learn the, the dates and to kind of get yourself ready for that question. Um, Throughout all of my finals, I always give you about three or four that you're going to have to go back in and look at the videos uh, probably to, to really be sure for your answer, but I'll kind of point you in the right direction. Number seven, what river did recent technology help biblical archaeologists to locate? 
that was the river Pishon. Right? So um, that was from the Genesis account. There were four rivers going out of the Garden of Eden. Right? Um, three of them are modern, and we still know where they're at. The fourth one has since dried up, but uh, satellite technology was able to find it. Right? They were able to, from high above, see the indention in the ground where the river used to run. And so that was the Pishon. Number eight, explain the significance of the gate of Laish. Laish is the old name for the city of Dan. This was a very northern city in the Promised Land. It was one of the cities that Abraham passed through right when he was entering the Promised Land. What's significant is that the gate is still there. Right? And so the, the gate that Abraham would have passed through as he's entering the Promised Land for the first time is still there. And they were able to find it, and so that's kind of an interesting discovery. Number nine, what role did archaeology play in our understanding of King Omri? King Omri only gets a couple of lines in the Bible, right? But archaeological discoveries have him as being a major king um, mm -hmm. in their world, right? So whenever enemy nations were referring to Judea, they would call it the House of David. Because David was such a prominent king. But when they would refer to the northern ten tribes, they called it the house of Omri. right? Because he was their uh, most prominent king. But he doesn't get a lot of mention in the Bible. But he did reign for a very long time. right? And so he was able to build quite a bit. Um, they were a very strong nation, the ten tribes were, during his reign. And so, But we, we get that understanding more from archaeology than we do from the Bible. Okay, number 10. List and describe three of the reasons given in class explaining why there might be so few little remains from ancient time periods. Okay, so this one I want you to look up kind of on your own, but I'll give you a clue as to what I'm talking about. One of them would be the fact that today in Jerusalem, there are all kinds of buildings built in the city, and so it's almost impossible to do archaeological excavations in that very important city of Jerusalem because it's got large buildings on it now, right? Okay, so there, there were several of those. I'll give you about six or seven. I, I just want you to give me three, right? And in this final, if, if this is your first final with me, uh, it's not like the reading quiz exactly. The reading quiz is like multiple choice. Um, with this, it's short answer, right? So you're going to be typing your answers in, right? And then I will go back in and read what you typed. Okay, so I give you an hour and a half to do your final because there is a lot of typing, right? Okay. What is the significance of the Ebla texts? The Ebla text, that was uh, the library at Ebla that was found. And this was from, this is before Abraham's time, right? Uh, a couple hundred years even before Abraham, they had a library there of over 17,000 tablets. Right? And so that's a huge library. And, and the significance of that is that for a long time, critics of the Bible used to say that Moses couldn't have written the Torah because people weren't writing much during that ancient time period. But we know Ebla was a thousand years before Moses, and they had 17 thousand tablets in their library so writing was very common and so that's important to silence the critics uh, in many ways right so number 12 describe the rock of beheston uh, so that's one that we talked about in class uh, just go back in look at your notes i just need a basic explanation of what that was same thing with the uh, obelisk of shalomaneser right those are two that i gave you pictures of and we talked about in class um this one was a giant rock in Iran. This one uh, had the picture of Jehu, if you remember, just to jog your memory. So go back in, look at your notes on those. Number 14, in your own words, explain the location and setting of Noah's Ark. Right. So these next couple ones are the ones that I want you to pretty much do on your own. But uh, we talked about Noah's Ark quite a bit. So when I say location and setting, um, I want you to talk about the location of it. Right. Where did I say... Uh, that I believe the actual spot of the discovery is. Give me some details. You don't have to describe it, you know, 
word for word, but but give me a couple of things. What country was it? What um, w- describe uh, the setting, right? Something like that, right? Okay, um, and you know, setting. What what did the ark look like, right? If you remember, uh, I'll give you a little bit of it. But the ark was ripped into two pieces, right? That's an example of something you could say, right? So just kind of describe to me uh, in your own words. The location, and so location is where it's at. Setting, what I mean by that is what what did it look like when they got there, right? Okay, number 15. In your own words, describe what the city of Sodom would have looked like, right? So here I want details about the structure of the city, right? So I talked to you about the wall. I talked to you about how many, uh, you know, an, an estimate about the number of acres. I talked to you about how tall the inner mound was and how there's a couple of mounds to it and different things like that. So so talk to me about what the city of Sodom would have looked like, right? 16, in your own words, explain the significance of at least three stories that were connected to the location of Sodom. So this we took two whole classes on. So I want you to go back in, look at your videos. I gave you about six stories that were connected. So things that took place other than the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah but they took place in that same basic spot, right? So I gave you about six. I want you to, to give me, in your own words, three of them, what took place there, why was it important, that kind of thing, right? 17, what was Fort Abram? Fort Abram was the name given to a city um, on a, a list of cities actually in Egypt. So in Karnak, on the wall, um, they give a listing of several cities uh, during the time of of Karnak's heyday there, and uh, which would have been not too long. Um, well, it would have been after Abraham's time, but it is interesting that they still called it Fort Abram. Um, in the Bible, we call it Bethsaida, right? Uh, or Beersheba, rather, excuse me. Uh, Beersheba. All right, so Beersheba being the southernmost city in Israel was a place that Abraham stayed um, because he had developed a large well there, right? So it was very easy for him to water his cattle and stuff, and so that became the southernmost city um, in the Promised Land. But it's interesting, the Egyptians didn't call it Beersheba like the Israelites did. The Egyptians called it Fort Abram, right, which is neat, Okay. Uh, lends some credibility to the biblical story because the surrounding nations uh, acknowledged that that was the city that Abraham was from or that Abraham basically built, right? 18, why might Moses have chosen to go to the land of Midian, right? So basically I want something to the effect that Midian was um, one of the children of Ishmael, right? Um, and that uh, that this would have been at least relatives um, from Abraham, right? That this would have been a group of people that uh, were at least connected to Moses through Abraham, and so they might have been more friendly to him, right? Why does the archaeological record of the Promised Land not show widespread destruction during the time of Joshua's conquest? I want something to the effect that God never asked Joshua to destroy all the cities in the Promised Land. There were only three uh, that were asked to be burned and destroyed all the rest of them they killed the people but didn't destroy the cities at all they they lived in the cities um and they just they would fight the people right and so uh, so you there is no record of destruction to find because god never asked them to destroy these cities right so that's a lot of times people use that but that as a critic of the bible without really having gone in and read the record and you know it kind of shows that they didn't really read it very carefully because it's not that they came in and destroyed all of these cities um, which was the pattern of many other invading nations like Babylon and Assyria they would come in and just destroy things and so a lot of times we project that onto Israel but that's not the case Israel was supposed to live there that was their land God said I'll give you cities that you didn't build and so they were supposed to leave these cities intact Number 20 goes along with this a little bit. Name the three cities that were burned during Joshua's conquest. So that's first was Jericho, then was Ai, and then after that in the north was Hazor. All right, 21. Describe the Tel Dan discovery. That was a an inscription, one of the, the only inscriptions that mentions the name of David. 
right? And so we, we don't have much that mentions David's name. We don't have much from anyone during that time period, right? We know in all the surrounding nations that all of them were well populated with their own kings and stuff, but we just don't have records of who any of these people were other than the Bible, right? It clearly tells us the stories of Saul and David and Solomon. So we so from the Bible perspective we know who these people were, but from the archaeological perspective we haven't found much with the names of any of these major characters. Tell Dan uh, was a, an inscription that mentions the house of David, right? And it was very close to the time of David. All right. 22. List two reasons why the traditional Temple Mount site might actually be Fortress Antonia. Okay, so I gave you several. Um, so a few that I just kind of threw out there. One is it's not really in the right spot, right? Uh, based on where we know the temple was supposed to be. It was supposed to be closer to the Gihon Spring, which the traditional Temple Mount site there that everybody goes to is not. Uh, second, uh, it's much bigger than we would expect the temple to have been, right? Based on what we know. Uh, three, we know that the legion, the tenth legion, was housed there. So that's like twelve thousand people. The small little building that they try and ascribe to Fortress Antonia couldn't have held a hundred people, hardly. You know, much less an entire legion. And so, uh, and then we have another reason. We have people that came and visited Israel right you know within a hundred years to two hundred years of its destruction and all of them talk about how the temple was utterly removed and was no longer standing there not even a stone just like Jesus had said uh, said the only thing standing left uh, was the massive fortress Antonia at the top of the hill okay 23 explain how understanding the geography of Caesarea Philippi enhances our understanding of the New Testament story that takes place there right so um, so just talk to me about that one. Explain to me what you learned about the story. That's where Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus says uh, that you know his father had revealed that to Peter and that upon this rock he will build his church and the gates of Hades will not overtake it. Right. And so we talked about how that rock there at the center of Caesarea Philippi with the spring called the gates of Hades and then the temple to Caesar on top. Jesus is saying that's a that's a picture really um, of how my church is going to look right and it's not going to be built on a physical rock it's going to be built on the testimony of people who believe that I am the Christ the Son of the Living God right so so talk to me about that something along those lines 24 explain how an understanding of New Testament burial practices sheds light on Jesus' statement to let the dead bury the dead right so this is the the last video that we did in the class and basically this one is talking about um, the two-stage burial that was very common in Israel, that they would let the body decompose for a year, and that's when the mourning would take place and all of that. And, and a year later, they would go back in and have a ceremony to collect the bones, and they would lay the dead, um, and they would say they were burying them with their fathers. Right? That's what that meant, that, uh, that the body had fully decomposed and they were going to take the bones and put them in an ossuary with all of their relatives, right? And so that would have been what Jesus was probably telling the guy to don't focus on that, follow me, is it wasn't that the guy's dad had just died. You know, the guy's dad had most likely been dead over a year at that point, and he was just wanting to do a ceremony. Okay, number 25, explain why Sepphoris might shed light on what kind of carpenter Joseph was, right? So basically I'm wanting something to the effect that Sepphoris was a huge city that was under construction for 20 years, and most of those 20 years would have fallen during Jesus' uh, teenage years and early years. Um, and so if Joseph was a carpenter, uh, most likely, that word just means builder, and so most likely Joseph would have been a stone worker of some kind, right? uh, because Sepphoris was a huge city built from stones, and and for 20 years, Nazareth, which is where Jesus lived, was a city just outside of Sepphoris, within walking distance. And so if Joseph was a stone worker, um, that might explain why they moved to Nazareth. To Nazareth, you know, Obviously, the Spirit of the Lord led them there, but that might have been part of it, that Joseph could find work and that they'd been able to do uh, a lot of the construction there at Sepphoris. Right? So some of that is conjecture, but 
it does shed a little light and kind of lean us in the direction that when we're trying to figure out what kind of builder was Joseph, that there's a very good chance he was a stone builder. Uh, that was much more common during that day. Okay, all right. So this is your final. Um, you know, watch this again if necessary. Um, study these. Make sure you know what you're going to say, so that when you come time to do the video, you can just type it out quickly, right? Um, and like I said, they won't be in the same order, but these will be the questions, right? Okay, sounds good. If you have any questions, just let me know.